ओम सदाशव सरंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यम अस्मराचार्य पर्यता वंदे गुरु परम ओम गुड प्लेस सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्त सह वीरवाह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मिषा ओ शाति 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 Oh. Good. Nice to see you all this morning for our ongoing classes on Bhagavad Gita. We continue our study of chapter uh, nine. Welcome also to all of our friends watching online. We'll begin uh, with some recitation. We're at actually at the final part of chapter nine. Uh, we'll recite starting with verses, uh, verse 29. And as always, be sure to read the translation as I'm chanting, and then repeat after me. Samoham sarva bhuteshu Samoham sarva bhuteshu Na me dveshyo sti na priya न मे द्वेश्योस्ति न प्रिय ये भजंति तो मां भक्त्या ये भजंति तो मां भक्त्या मयि ते ते शुचाप्यहम मयि ते ते शुचाप्ययम अपि चेत सुदुराचारो अपि चेत सुदुराचारो भजते मामन्य भाग भजते मामन्य भाग साधु रेव समंथव्य साधु रेव समंथव्य सम्यक व्यवसित हो सह सम्यक व्यवसित हो सिह क्षिप्रम भवति धर्मात्मा क्षिप्रम भवति धर्मात्मा शश्वत्ति निगछति शश्वत्ति निगछति खाउंथे अतिजानी खाउंथे अतिजानी न मे भक्त प्रणश्यति न मे भक्त प्रणश्यति माम ही पार्थ व्यपाश्रित्य माम ही पार्थ व्यपाश्रित्य ये पिस्यु प्यापयो नयः ये पिस्यु पापयो नयः स्त्रियो वैश्यास्तथा शूद्रास स्त्रियो वैश्यास्तथा थेपियांथी पराम गतम् थेपियांथी पराम गतम् किम् पुनर् ब्राह्मणः पुन्या किम् पुनर् ब्राह्मणः पुन्या भक्ताराजर्शयस्तथा भक्ताराजर्शयस्तथा अनित्यमसुखम् लोकम् अनित यमसुखम लोकम इमम प्राप्य भजस्य माम इमम प्राप्य भजस्व माम 
And that's the final verse of the chapter. I think we'll get there. We'll see how our class proceeds. <coughs> so we continue our study of Jnana Vijnana Yoga, chapter 9, in which Sri Krishna makes a very powerful statement that you can't just worship blindly based on blind faith. He not say you can't, but he, he stresses the importance of knowing Gaining, to, gaining spiritual knowledge, gaining true understanding of who and what is that Ishvara you pray to and, and worship. And he continues now, actually towards the conclusion now of this chapter, we began seeing verse 29 in our last class. Let's return there now. Well, you can repeat it again, and then uh, we'll see it in more detail. We just began in the last class. Samoham sarva bhuteshu, Samoham sarva bhuteshu, Name dvaishyo sti napriyaha, Name dvaishyo sti matpriyaha, Ye bhajanti tu maam bhaktya, Ye bhajanti tu maam bhaktya, Maite te shu chapyaham, Maite te shu chapyaham. I mentioned in our last class that this verse is interpreted quite differently by Shankaracharya in his commentary and by Madhusudana Saraswati, whose commentary I'm also following in these, uh, to prepare for these classes. They're both great Advaitins. Uh, Madhusudana actually is in the lineage of Shankaracharya. And even then, they find s different interpretations here. And as we discussed, just to wrap up a discussion in our prior class, if you ask which interpretation is correct, and I'll give you two interpretations right now, if you ask which is correct, you remember what I said at the end of the last class, any interpretation that is faithful both to the verse and faithful to the context is correct. Faithful to the context means to the entire Bhagavad Gita and to the entire tradition. So, so translations or interpretations have to be not only literally correct, but they have to fit in to the entire teaching tradition. So first, we'll, we'll see this verse twice. First using Shankara's interpretation, then using Madhusudana's interpretation. According to Shankara, uh, Sri Krishna says here, Aham, I, I am the Sama, I am the same, Sarva Bhuteshu, towards all beings. I look at all beings as being the same. Therefore, Name Dveshyaha, me, for me, Nadveshyaha, no one is hated for me, by me, asti, napriyaha, nor is anyone specially loved by me. I don't especially, I don't pick anyone out and dislike that one. I don't pick anyone out and, and specially love that one. And the, and the basis for that statement is a topic we've discussed many times before. I won't go in detail here. But remember, we've discussed Ishvara as being karma pala data, the giver of the fruits of your deeds. When you do harmful adharmic deeds, Ishvara gives you undesirable results. Doesn't mean he hates you. He impartially and correctly, justly, he justly gives you the results that you yourself has, have earned. And in the same way, when you, um, 
when you do good actions, then Ishvara blesses you. He's not giving you special treatment. You get what you deserve based on your deeds. This idea of an Ishvara who punishes us and rewards us, that idea is not uncommon among Hindus, but it's actually based more in biblical teachings and much less so in the teachings of, of Sri Krishna and all of the Hindu teachings are not based on a God who punishes and rewards. You get what you deserve. I think a story I've, I've, I made up long ago to explain this. If you're in a store and you accidentally break something, say there's a vase sitting on, on a shelf, you're looking at it, you're debating whether or not to buy it, you put it back on the shelf, it falls to the floor and breaks. And then the storekeeper will ask you to pay for it since you broke it. That payment is not a punishment, right? It is the consequence of your own deeds. This is how the Hindu tradition looks upon Ishvara, not as a god who punishes us for our bad deeds or rewards us for our good deeds, but an Ishvara, a god of the cosmos, who gives us the results of our own karma, the results of deeds. He gives us results we ourselves have earned. And that's why, according to Shankara, the interpretation is, Name Dweshyaha Asti, no one is hated by me, which means when you get undesirable results from Ishvara, it's not because he's somehow against you, it's because you have earned those undesirable results. Name Priyaha, nor is anyone specially loved by me, when you receive wonderful things in life, blessings from Ishvara, it's not because you have somehow earned Ishvara's special favor. He says, Samaha Aham, I am the same towards all. On the other hand, Ye Bhajanti tu Mam Bhaktya tu. On the other hand, Ye Bhajanti, those who worship, Mom, me, Sri Krishna says. And please remember, when Sri Krishna says Mom, he is not referring to himself usually. He is not referring to himself as Arjuna's charioteer. He is not referring to himself as an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. He is referring to himself as Ishvara, God of the cosmos. So, ye bhajanti Mom, those who worship me, Bhaktya, with devotion, with pure hearts. What about them? Te mayi. They are in me. Te shu cha api aham. Breaking those words apart. Cha api aham. Cha and api also. Aham, I, te shu, I am them, in them. Those who worship me with devotion I am in them, and they are in me. Now compare the two halves of this verse. There actually seems to be a contradiction. In the first half of the verse, he says, I am samaha, towards all. Second half of the verse, he says, except <laughs> two. But if they worship me with devotion, then it's a special case. He seems that he's not contradicting himself, but it looks like. A contradiction. First verse he says, I'm the same towards all. Second half he says, but those who worship me with devotion, they are in me, I am in them, implying a special relationship. Of course, we already know that Ishvara abides equally in all, and that's going to be Madhusudana's explanation. Hold off on that just for a moment. We already know that. So how do we understand this apparent special treatment? First Sri Krishna says, I am the same towards all, but then he says, but I am especially close, especially intimate for those who worship me. And that's very meaningful. Even, and it's not contradictory, I'll show you why. Even though Ishvara treats all the same as karma paladata, as a giver of the fruits of actions, if you pray more, 
wouldn't it necessarily be true you receive more results of good karma? It's just prayer is a, is a punya karma. The more you pray, the more of Ishwara's blessings you receive. Remember the Manda Baba story about receiving the rainwater? I won't, won't tell that story again. So he's pointing out something very pragmatic that yes, it's true that Ishwara impartially gives everyone the results of their deeds. For good deeds, desirable results. For bad deeds, undesirable results. But those who pray, those who worship, those who develop a personal relationship with Ishwara, they are specially blessed by their prayer and worship. They're specially blessed. Shankara gives a wonderful metaphor to explain it. He uses this metaphor of a fire. So that fire burns and gives off heat. Who gets the heat of that fire? Well, it depends on how close you're sitting to the fire. If you're sitting very close, you get more heat. If you're sitting at some distance, you get less heat. And who chooses how close you sit to the fire? You do. You can choose to sit closer, receive more heat. You can choose to sit further away, you receive less heat. In the same way, that heat of the fire represents Ishwara's blessings. It's up to you. You can choose to be closer to Ishwara, bhaktiya, by worshiping and praying with devotion in your heart. And in that way, being closer to Ishvara, you receive more heat, metaphorically. You receive more blessings. Or you may choose not to. It's fine. It's not, you know, to be very silly, it's not that Ishvara gets really sad and disappointed when you don't pray. Oh, no one's worshiping me today. You know, we can't imagine such an Ishvara. It's just impossible. So, that worship is for your sake. You can choose to pray more. You can choose to pray less. Shir Shankara merely points out the, the reality of the matter. When you pray with your heart full of devotion, you receive more blessings. Now, second interpretation. According to Madhusudana, he says, going back to the beginning of the verse, Sri Krishna says, Aham Samaha, I am the same. Sarva Bhute Shu. Shankara interpreted as, interpreted as, I am the same towards all beings. Madhusudana says, I am the same in all beings. For our grammar students, this is locative plural, and both meanings are possible for that sarva bhute shu, either towards all beings or in all beings. Madhusudana said, I, Sri Krishna says, I am the same towards all beings. Shankara interprets it differently. I am the same in all beings, abiding within. Therefore, name dvesha asti, no one is hated by me. Shankara says, I'm, Sri Krishna is not, Ishvara is not more present in some people. I'm sorry, less present, nadveshyaha. He says, I'm not, not hated for anyone, means I am not less present in some people, na priyaha, nor am I more present in some people. I am samaha, equally present in all people, saint and sinner alike. And this is a very important teaching, in the, uh, in, especially in the general Hindu tradition, where we acknowledge the fundamental nature of all beings is divine. Ishvara dwells identically in all people. Therefore, all people are divine in essence, which is why, as I've explained before, why we can greet each other, namaste. We use words that we use to worship Ishvara, we use those same words, namahate, salutations to you. We use those same words to greet each other, recognizing the divinity of every single person. But now, <clears throat> we have a question. And that is, 
if Ishvara is equally present in all people, how do we explain the horrible or even evil behavior of some people? Just the other week, there was another school shooting. A young man took a, an assault rifle into a school and killed a dozen children and teachers. Just horrible things. Bear in mind, that young man was as divine as anyone, as divine as the greatest saint who ever walked on this planet. You can't say that a saint is more divine and this young man is less divine. <clears throat> Sri Krishna says here, according to Shankara's interpretation, I am equally present in the, in the greatest saint to walk on this planet. I am equally present in that boy who shot and killed all those teachers and students. How are we to understand that? That's what the second half explains. Ye bhajanti tu maam bhaktya tu. But, ye bhajanti, those who worship maam, me, bhaktya with devotion, mai te, they are in me, te shucha api, aham, and I am in them. So here, He's pointing out a difference in some people who have hearts full of devotion for Ishvara. That special relationship is called out here. You can be sure that that young man who committed that horrible act probably didn't go to church. I'm presuming he comes from a Christian family. He probably didn't go to church regularly, and he probably didn't have a very deep devotional relationship with Jesus Christ, to use their tradition. So Shankara explains it in, in a, he uses a brilliant metaphor. In fact, you may have heard this metaphor. He is, according to Shankara, so this is a different interpretation, he says that the sun shines equally on everything, but on something that's very dark and dull, the sun doesn't get reflected as much. Something that's very bright and shiny, the sun reflects more, like a mirror. When the sh sun shines on a mirror, th that sun is, you can't, you can't look into the mirror that's aimed at the sun. It blinds your eyes. That mirror reflects the sun's reflection so intensely. And you've heard the metaphor before, our minds are like the mirror. When our minds are very pure, our minds reflect that inner divinity brilliantly towards others. But when the mirrors of our minds are filthy, dirty, covered with hate, covered with hurt, covered with all emotional problems, and ultimately covered with ignorance, when the mirrors of our minds are, are filthy, then that inner divinity doesn't get reflected. What a brilliant metaphor. So that explains the, the, the saintly ones who walk on our planet are those with minds and hearts which have been purified. Purified how? Through the practice of bhakti. And ultimately, purified through all these teachings which remove the dirt called ignorance. When that final layer of, of ignorance is removed from the mirror, I'm mixing metaphors here, when that fi final layer of dirt that represents ignorance is removed from that mirror, then that mirror shines more brightly than anything that mirror represents those saints whose minds and hearts have been completely purified as opposed to others 
whose minds and hearts are just filled with so much egotism, pride, desire, um, enmity, hate towards others, this bias, and we're seeing so much of this, um, you know, bias against racial groups, bias against ethnic groups, bias, bias against political groups. The Democrats are biased against the Republicans, Republicans are biased against the Democrats, and it leads to this really negative, awful thinking that colors our, our minds and colors our thinking and is like a veil covering that inner divinity, or to go back to our metaphor, more dirt on the mirror. So look how beautiful Shankara's metaphor is. When that mirror is cleansed, that inner divinity which is equally present in all, that inner divinity is fully manifest, but when that mirror mind, so to speak, is covered with, with impurities, then that inner divinity, even though it's equally present, is impeded from shining forth. It's prevented from shining forth due to those impurities. So nicely, they both, they both uh, describe it. Um, I noticed that at the end of Madhusudana's commentary, he refers to Shankara's commentary. He says you can also take it like a fire. He actually refers to Shankara's commentary, meaning that, that Madhusudana is not saying that Shankara is wrong. He's just offering an alternate interpretation for this verse. Okay, nice. Continuing. Apichet sudara charo, apichet sudara charo, bhajate mamananya bhak, bhajate mamananya bhak, sadhureva samantavyaha. Sadhu Reva Samantavya Samyak Vyavasito Hisaha Samyak Vyavasito Hisaha <coughs> Apichet and even if Su Duracharaha Even if a person happens to be a Duracharaha One whose behavior is terrible how terrible? Su dur acharaha. Really terrible. <laughs> really bad. So even if a person is a person's behavior, remember we just distinguished. Ishvara is equally present in all people. There are no such people as demonic people. There are people who have demonic traits. We're going to see much later in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna is going to give a whole chapter on divine and demonic traits. Not divine and demonic people. Divine and demonic traits. Traits of the mind and heart. So here, those who have minds and hearts full of impurities, whose mirrors don't reflect anything at all, sudara charaha, one who's one who is is terrible sinner. That's a fine translation. So one who, whose behavior is terrible. Suppose that person Bhajate worships Mom, Sri Krishna says, Mom referring to Ishra. Suppose that person person worships Ananya Bhak with a mind which is focused on devotion. A mind that is fully absorbed in devotional practices. A person whose behavior is terrible, who then turns to prayer and devotion. You already know th where this verse goes. You understand the power of bhakti, prayer, to transform a person. There's, a, there's this wonderful traditional story, most of you know this story, of Valmiki, the author of the Ramayana. So the story goes that before he became a great rishi, he was a thief. 
and he would rob passerbys on the highway of all of their possessions and sometimes kill them. And the story goes, I'll tell it in brief, the story goes that one day uh, this, this Valmiki, who, who was going after a group of people that included the Rishi Narada. And Narada managed, I, it's a long story, I'll spare you all the details, but Narada managed to convince Valmiki to change his ways. But Valmiki said, how can I change? How can I possibly change? I've been doing this my whole life. Yeah, I just actually, pardon me for, the, for an aside in a story. So it's like <laughs> a distraction to a distraction. I was watching a movie on uh, inmates in a prison in uh, Venezuela. Very grim, uh, dark thing. And as one inmate was interviewed, and said, you know, do you think you will change when you get out of prison? And his inmate said, how can I change? All I know, how, all I know what to do is to steal. What a sad story. He didn't know what else to do, so he, w he thought that when he got out of prison, he would, steal, con he would continue to steal, and he'd probably end up back in prison. This is a very real problem. And it's the problem of the of our penal system in this country and around the world, whereas uh, um, inmates are not reformed, inmates are punished. And you see the problem with that. When you merely punish inmates, they go out and they, they commit crimes again. So there's, there's a lack, perhaps, of an effort to reform criminals in our, in our penal system, that's a huge topic, we'll, we'll set that aside. Come back now to Valmiki, who was like that, that uh, fellow in prison. He said, how can I reform myself? I've been doing this my whole life, I don't know anything else to do. And Narada taught Valmiki to recite the name of God, Ram. Rama, Rama, Rama. Actually, the, remember the trick? Some of you know this story. Narada used a trick to get Valmiki to do so. So he said, instead of, he's told Valmiki to recite the word Mara. Mara is Rama backwards. Mara means kill <laughs> in the Sanskrit. And, not, and Valmiki was able to recite, okay, Mara, Mara, Mara. But when you keep chanting repeatedly, Mara, 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 it becomes Rama. I can't, do, I can't demonstrate for you, but the syllables are there. So depending on where you start, if you begin ma, or if you begin on ra. So anyway, he, he taught uh, Valmiki to recite Rama, name of God, and Valmiki was transformed through that practice. That was the, the essence of that story, is that a lifelong thief was reformed through that practice, chanting the name of God, and ended up being so transformed, he became the author of the Ramayana. Famous story, you can go and get all the details. It's a delightful story. So the point here is, if simply reciting the word Rama can transform this thief who became Valmiki, you can imagine that someone who is Ananya Bhak, deeply engaged in devotional practice, any such person can be transformed. Bhakti is a transformative practice, perhaps because it addresses us emotionally. Sometimes when we're addressed intellectually, it's not enough. Valmiki perhaps was intellectually convinced that he should give up being a thief. He needed to be emotionally convinced. And that's a special characteristic of bhakti, devotion, in that it addresses us emotionally. So that person, sudhara charaha, no matter how nasty, terrible their behavior might be, if that person, bhajati, uh, where is it? 
If that person, Bhajate Maam, worships Ishvara Ananya Bhak with a very deep sense of devotion, then in the third line, Saha Mantavyaha, that person should be considered Saduhu Eva. As a saint, that person should be given the benefit of the doubt as, and looked upon as a saint. Why? Well, in the next verse, you'll see why. Because that person will become a saint. Maybe that person is just stopped the harmful behaviors and has not yet undertaken good behaviors. Maybe that person is in a transitional period. Sri Krishna says, Saha Mantavyaha. That person should be considered sadhu. The literal meaning of sadhu, by the way, as an adjective, is good. Monks who wear this dress are called sadhus because they are good people. At least we hope <laughs> they're good people. <laughs> and, and he, uh, Sri Krishna concludes here, he, because saha, that person, who has previously engaged in harmful adharmic behaviors, but now is engaged in prayer and worship, that person, samyak vyavasataha, vyavasataha. That person has vyavasata, has chosen samyak correctly. That person has chosen wisely, or to put it in other terms, that person has changed course and is on the right path. And previously on the path of adharma. When you're going on the path of adharma, it leads you to further adharma. And when you have undergone this transformation, you're now on the path of dharma, which leads to further dharma, as Sri Krishna describes in the next verse. Chipram bhavati dharmatma, chipram bhavati dharmatma, shashvat chantim nigachati, shashvat chantim nigachati, kaunteya pratijanihi, kaunteya pratijanihi, name bhakta pranashyati, name bhakta. Pranashyati. So continuing the same idea here. So that, that person who was Sudur Achara, whose conduct was terrible, that person now Bhavati, Chipram Bhavati, soon becomes Dharmatma. Here Atma means mind or heart. One whose mind and heart is Dharmic righteous. That person soon acquires a righteous heart, a righteous attitude, and negachati soon reaches, that word chipram in the first line, that person soon reaches shashvat shantim, eternal peace. It's on the right path. It's only a matter of time. If you're on the wrong path, just to conclude that point I made in a prior verse, the longer you're on the wrong path, the worse things get. The longer you're on the right path, the better things get. This person has undergone a conversion of attitude and has given up a life of adharma, has taken to the path of dharma, and eventually that path of dharma leads where? Shashvat shantim, complete peace, eternal peace. Kaunteya, O son of Kunti, Arjuna, pratijani hi. You should understand. Ye samjo, you'd say. <laughs> understand this. Understand what? Sri Krishna says in the last, lines, last line very beautifully, and people quote this also. Na me bhaktaha pranashyati. Me bhaktaha, someone who is devoted to me, na pranashyati, is never, literally never destroyed, in context, never lost. 
someone whose life is directed towards Ishvara on that path of Dharma, that person is never lost by taking that path of Dharma. Their lives will improve, the qualities of their lives will improve, and being on that path of Dharma, not only will their, the quality of their life will improve, but they will become a blessing to so many others who are also on that path of Dharma. Name bhaktaha pranashyati. No one who is devoted to Ishvara is lost. Very beautiful. Mam hi partha vyapashritya. Mam hi partha vyapashritya. Ye pisyu papa yonayaha. Ye pisyu papa yonayaha. Striyo vaishyastata shudras. Striyo vaishyastata. Te pianti param gatim. Te pianti param gatim. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Start in the second line. Ye suhu. Those who happen to be. Those who happen to be. Papa Yonayaha. Actually, we'll take suhu later. Ye. Those who, go now go first line, those who, parta o arjuna, those who, mam hi vyapashritya, vyapashritya, having resorted to mam hi, he indeed, those who have resorted to me, those who seek me with prayer and devotion, ye vyapashritya mam, those who come to me, those who seek me, who, now in the second line, api, api, even if, siuhu, even if they happen to be papa yonayaha, papa yoni, yoni here means, means literally womb, but birth. Those whose births are the result of papa, papa karma. Papa Yoni is one who is born into an undesirable situation because of adharmic deeds done in a prior life. This is how we understand the doctrine of karma that is due to, adha due to an accumulation of Papa Karma, sin, uh, bad deeds done in a prior life. The consequence can be Birth as a human being, even though birth as a human being is generally considered good, there are gradations and some possibilities are not so good. You could get born into a very unfortunate situation. Long ago, I think in this series of classes on Bhagavad Gita, I've given the example of someone, someone who's born into a family where mother is addicted to drugs and father is not even around. That happens a lot. Think about it. In poor slum neighborhoods in this country and around the world, mothers who are addicted to drugs give birth. Fathers are not in the picture. Mothers are probably in, in a state of poverty and drug addicted. What kind, of, what kind of life is that child born into? The child didn't choose such a birth, but we would explain such a situation as that child is suffering the consequences of harmful deeds, adharmic deeds, done in a prior life. What chance would that child have to come up in life? It's possible for such a child to come up in life, but the, to use the American metaphor, the cards are stacked against him. 
That is to say that that child is born with a huge disadvantage. No. There are many who are born with a huge disadvantage. In ancient India, I'm introducing now the next line. In ancient India, to be born as a woman was to be born with a disadvantage. Because as a woman, you were prevented from being deeply engaged in spiritual and religious practices. That's not true today, thank goodness. Well, well to, some, to some extent, we still see this patriarchal discrimination against women. It's to some measure, it's still present today, but in ancient times it was much more prevalent. So women were born, to be born as a woman in ancient times was to be born into a disadvantaged situation. You had, you had to work harder at it. Women were not given access to the Vedic teachings. Similarly, Vaishyaha Shudraha, this is the next line. So, so many people will misinterpret this line. Sri Krishna is not criticizing women and Vaishnavas and Shudras, members the members of the lower so-called castes, please, Sri Krishna is not criticizing them at all, but making a, an, an important observation to be born as a woman and to be born into the lower castes, the Vaish, Vaishya caste, I said Vaishnava before, Vaishya, the caste of the uh, farmers and merchants, or Shudras, the caste of workers, laborers, to be born into those lower castes in ancient times, and even to some measure today, creates a disadvantaged situation for the person. They have to work much harder to bring themselves up to be born, let's admit it, to be born into a poor, economically disadvantaged family anywhere in the world is a disadvantage. That's just a fact. And why, why does that happen? Well, I'm not going to give a, we're not going to talk about economics in this class. There's lots of economic reasons for the, the um, unjust distribution of wealth. Why is it that 1% of the people in this world possess 99% of the wealth? I'm not sure what the exact numbers are, but you get the point. 99% of the wealth of the world is, con is confined to 1% of, of its population. There is an unfair distribution of wealth. We're not going to go into the reasons for it. But as a consequence, so many people are born into a disadvantaged situation. And we would explain that in terms of being the consequences of bad karmas from prior lives. So that was true in ancient times, and it's true in different ways today. So to be born into the lower caste in ancient times, to be born into a, an impoverished family in modern times. But Sri Krishna says here that even them, that word in the second line, api siuhu, even those who are papa yonayaha, born into those, those unfortunate situations due to bad karmas, even them, last line, te api, even they, yanti, can reach param gatim, the highest goal. So even being born with, into a disadvantaged situation in, in that slum in New York City where mother is a drug addict and poor and father is not in the picture, even that child can come up. By the way, we'll take this a step further. That child needs help. Those who are born into those disadvantaged situations need help. And I would suggest that each and every one of us bear the responsibility 
to make that help available. Doesn't mean you have to go to the slum of New York and start, start, start helping these people, but in some appropriate way, we bear the responsibility to help those born into those disadvantaged situations. We have the responsibility to help them, give them the opportunity to come up. And Sri Krishna says that they can, te api, even they, param gatim, the highest goal, yanti, they can reach, and they, they, they can reach with a little help. They need a hand, and we can be ready to give them that hand that they need and deserve. Okay. <clears throat> Kim punar brahmana punya. Kim punar brahmana punya. Bhakta rajarshayastata. Bhakta rajarshayastata. Anityamasukam lokam. Anitya masukam lokam, imam prapya bhajaswamam, imam prapya bhajaswamam. <coughs> In the previous uh, verse, he's talked about even those who are born into terrible situations, even they can come up in life through bhakti through being on the path of dharma. Kimpunaha, and then what to speak of, punyaha brahmanaha, what to speak of pious priests, bhaktaha, and those who are devoted, rajarshayaha tata, and those who are raja rishi, um, they, they, they are members of the kshatriya, uh, caste. They are warriors. They are not. The, so, prior verse, Sri Krishna made mention of the low. The so, when we say lower of the, I have to have to point out that to say higher and lower when referring to the castes is a figurative usage. It's not that Brahmanas are higher than Shudras, but this is the conventional way of describing. The brahmanas, the priests, as being the highest caste, the uh, kshatriyas, the warriors and politicians, as being below, and vaishyas, farmers and merchants, as being below that, shudras, workers, as being below that. To call them higher and lower is not correct. They're different, absolutely different. Everyone has a different role in life but we can't say higher and lower. After all, Sri Krishna, a few verses said, I am equally present in all, equally present in the pious Brahmana, and equally present in the Shudra, the worker. But here what Sri Krishna is saying, though, then in a prior verse, those who are born with a disadvantage can come up, then what about those who are born with an advantage? <laughs> who is born has an advantage? I think we can all raise our hands. We weren't born to a mother who was poor and, and addicted to drugs. We were born into families. All of our families had, had their shortcomings. I understand that. But not like that boy who was born into the family where mother is poor and addicted to drugs. So we are all born with a tremendous advantage. And the point here, and Sri Krishna is going to make it very powerfully in the second half of the verse, is when you're born with this advantage, what's your excuse? <laughs> what possible excuse could there be for squandering this hu first of all to be born as a human being is a gr is a great blessing and then to be born as a human being into a relatively healthy family and if you're born into a really pious family that's a double blessing my gosh 
how blessed we are, how fortunate we are. So for such people, in the final line, imam prapya, prapya, having gained imam, having gained imam, and in the third line, imam lokam, having gained this life, this world, having been born as a human being, this world which is anityam, which is transient, asukam, and full of suffering, having been born into the world which is transient and full of suffering, but yet having been born not into that family with so many disadvantages, but having been born into a relatively healthy family. And another advantage we've all had, and something that should never be taken for granted, is the, is the blessing of education. All of us have received really good educations in life. And that education has molded us and transformed us. That boy born to the drug-addicted uh, mother, if that boy can make it through high school and make it into college, that boy can do anything in life. Isn't it true? Coming from that family, but if that boy, and sadly what is often the case, that boy gets to high school, gets involved with drugs and gangs, quits high school, is out on the street peddling drugs, stealing to support drugs, ends up in jail, that's the wrong path. If that boy can stay in high school and get into college, anything is possible. That boy could become, literally, that boy could grow up to become a future president of this country. Possible. And education is the key. So we have been all blessed with the blessing of a reasonably healthy family, and some of you have had just extraordinarily great families, and all of us have also been blessed with the, the blessing of education. Having been given all of those opportunities to, to squander, <laughs> to squander this life by merely being engaged in materialistic pursuits would be a horrible waste. So Sri Krishna says, Bhajaswamam. Having having been blessed with a good birth. Here he's addressing Arjuna. Arjuna was born in a great family. So having been, bo for Arjuna, having been born in a great family, Arjuna having received a good education, Arjuna being born with those advantages, with those blessings, Arjuna is told here, Bajaswa Mam, O Arjuna, you should worship me. Don't squander your life. And of course, that's a powerful message for us all. We've been given all of these advantages in life. Let us not squander them. And by dedicating yourself, as you have, by dedicating yourself to a life of spiritual growth, you are, ble you are make, taking full advantage of the blessings you've received and by continuing on this path, you become more and more of a blessing for others. So you take advantage of your situation, you come up in spiritual life, you take that path of dharma, taking that path of dharma becomes a blessing for you and becomes a blessing for so many others that you can then help. And that brings us to the final verse <coughs> of the chapter. Manmana bhava mad bhakto, manmana bhava mad bhakto, mad yaji mam namaskuru, mad yaji mam namaskuru, mame vaishyasi yuktvayvam, mame vaishyasi yuktvayvam, atmanam mat parayanaha, atmanam mat 
Parayanaha. So Sri Krishna gives this final, final message. And a message of encouragement to Arjuna and to all of us. It's as though we're looking, I always, in my mind, it's, it's like when we study the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna is giving this discourse to Arjuna in the chariot, and we're all looking over Arjuna's shoulder, <laughs> so to speak, and taking advantage of, of what is being taught to Arjuna in that dialogue. So Sri Krishna here addresses not just Arjuna, Sri Krishna addresses us all. Man mana bhava. Bhava, O Arjuna, and all of us, you should be man mana. Man manaha. Man and mat are the pronoun form of me. Your manas, your mind, should be fixed on me. Man mana bhava. Keep your mind fixed on me. Mad bhaktaha bhava. Be a bhakta, be a be devoted to me. Mad yaji. Worship me. And worship here doesn't necessarily mean doing puja or doing, doing yajna, homa, havan, etc. As we've discussed so much in the teachings on karma yoga, to worship Ishvara means to follow dharma. Remember the reasoning? How is following dharma a sacrifice? Yaji. Be a worshiper, be a sacrificer, mud, to me. Mud yaji, literally, sacrifice to me. You can sacrifice to Ishwara by following Dharma. What are you sacrificing? Your own raga and dvesha, your own likes and dislikes. To use my guru's language, you set aside your own selfish agenda to follow dharma. You set aside the impulses of raga and dvesha. Raga, the impulse to chase after what looks nice. Dvesha, the impulse to run away from what looks difficult. You set those impulses. You overcome those impulses. You set aside your own agenda. You sacrifice your own agenda to follow dharma. That's karma yoga. And as I've pointed out before, the distinction that's often made between karma yoga and bhakti, it's a completely arbitrary distinction. Karma yoga is bhakti. Bhakti is karma yoga. The only distinction is karma yoga is bhakti in action. That's, that's what it is. Karma yoga is bhakti in action action. Both are bhakti. So, madhyaji, sacrifice to me by setting aside your agenda. Mam namaskuru. Namaskuru, do namaste. Mam, unto me. Worship me. Pray to me. Offer your deeds to me. We've talked in karma yoga, ishvara arpana buddhi that attitude of offering the fruits of our works to Ishvara. We won't return to those discussions. You can go back and review those teachings that we saw in chapter 3 especially. And in this way, the third, third verse, third line at the end, evam, thus, in this way, you, we have to break those words apart, yuktva, Evam, evam, thus yuktwa, yuktwa, engaging, engaging what? Last line, atmanam, referring to your mind and heart here. Yuktwa, atmanam, engaging your mind and heart, evam, in this way, how? Manmana, by focusing your attention on, on Ishvara, mad bhaktaha, being devoted, mad yaji, sacrificing, mam namaskaru, offering our deeds to Ishvara, evam, thus, yuktva atmanam, engaging your mind and heart in this way, 
and being mat parayanaha, the last word of the chapter, having mat me as your parayana, as your goal, having Ishvara as your goal. What is the goal? Not earning more money, <laughs> not climbing the corporate ladder. And the goal is in a, in a more narrow bhakti-oriented sense, the goal is Ishvara, but in a broader sense, the goal is spiritual growth. Bhakti, as, as we've understood, is one of several elements that constitute a life of spiritual growth. The focus of this chapter, chapter 9, is on bhakti. But we've also saw the, the necessity for spiritual wisdom, the need for meditation, and of course the need for karma yoga. But here we find the focus is on bhakti, matparayanaha, having Ishvara as your goal. Third line, mam eva eshyasi, in the future tense. You will reach mam eva, you will reach me indeed, is the assurance of Sri Krishna to Arjuna and to all of us who are looking over Arjuna's shoulder and being blessed by this discourse by being engaged in some form of prayer and devotion and worship, we will certainly be blessed. We will reach Ishvara through this process. Just to make one final point here, the focus of this chapter is bhakti, but as I just said, you can't practice only bhakti and expect to be successful in your life of spiritual growth. The emphasis of this chapter is bhakti. So we said, if, if Sri Krishna can be paraphrased to say, through the practice of bhakti, you will reach me. But back in chapter two, he said, through spiritual wisdom, you'll reach me. In chapter three, he said, through karma yoga, you'll reach me. In chapter six, he said, through meditation, you'll reach me. So if you ask, well, which one should I follow? If that's your question, you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> Sorry to be a little sarcastic. You haven't been paying attention because, as you've heard me say, and as Sri Krishna has said, all of these are necessary. You don't get to pick and choose. All of these spiritual practices are, re are required. Here, the focus is on bhakti. So Sri Krishna says, through these devotional practices, mameva eshyasi, you will certainly reach me. Okay, nice. Um, before we finish this chapter, we've been finishing each chapter by reciting the English version. We'll do that now. Remember that these English verses are composed to follow the meter of the original. So I will, uh, well, we'll get started. <clears throat> Let me recite the first verse. Nero. It's also a condensed or abbreviated version. So in a few minutes, we can recite these, uh, this English version of chapter 9. Nice way to review the chapter uh, before we conclude our study of it. <coughs> for the first verse, listen and repeat. And for the following verses, we will chant together. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> listen and repeat. The blessed Lord said, the blessed Lord said unto you, I shall now declare, unto you, I shall now declare, of all knowledge the most obscure, of all knowledge the most obscure, knowing this highest sacred truth, knowing this highest sacred truth, you will be freed from suffering, you will be freed from suffering. Chant with me now. This entire vast universe is pervaded by me unseen. All things exist because of me. 
but I do not depend on them. Just as the atmosphere above, though enormous, abides in space, in the same way, please understand, everything here abides in me. All creatures at the end of time unto my nature must return. When the world's next cycle begins, once again I will send them forth. Nature under my sole control produces everything that is animate and inanimate. Thus the cycle of life proceeds. The ignorant perceive me not. Since I assumed a human form, they fail to grasp my higher truth as the great Lord of all that is. But those whose minds are vast indeed recognize my nature divine. They worship me most faithfully knowing me as the source of all, always chanting my holy names, committed firmly, striving hard, bowing down with great reverence, ever absorbed they worship me, others through knowledge worship me, regarding me in diverse ways, as being one or manifold, or manifesting as it forms. I am the rites and sacrifice. I am the fire and offerings. I am the Vedas, mantras too, and the sacred syllable home. I am the Lord and highest goal shelter, refuge, and friend as well, source, sustainer, destroyer too, the everlasting reservoir, wanting to dwell in heaven's realms. They worship me through Vedic rites, Indra's kingdoms they can achieve, and there enjoy divine delights. Having enjoyed that paradise, when all their grace has been consumed, they return to this mortal plane. Seeking pleasure, they come and go, but those who pray me steadfastly, even those praying other gods, full of faith, they all come to me. Even if they break Vedic rules of flower, leaf, water, or fruit, anything given with true love, all such offerings I accept from those whose minds and hearts are pure. Whatever you eat or you do, whatever you give or sacrifice, Whatever penance you perform, do as an offering to me. Even if the most wicked ones worship me with one-pointed minds, they soon acquire righteous hearts. None devoted to me can fail. Worship me with your heart and mind. Offer sacrifice and respect. Be devoted entirely. You shall certainly come to me. And there we have in summary, chapter 9, a very beautiful and important verse. Uh, next week we'll begin our study of chapter 10. I'll give a proper introduction at that time. Um, one announcement before we conclude 
Um, uh, last week, some of you had volunteered to help with a gardening project. We ha they haven't quite con concluded, finished the gardening work that can be done. We could use a few more volunteers today. The weather, I think, is still nice. It's not raining. Um, and there'll be some lunch prepared, so you can go out and uh, help with the gardening project, enjoy some lunch. And um, I, I'm amused when I think of gardening as a spiritual practice, pulling out weeds, that's mostly what needs to be done, by the way. <laughs> pulling out weeds is like pulling out raga duesha. Pulling another one, get rid of another one, get rid of another one. That's a good practice. So anyway, if, if you're able to stay back after class, please help with the gardening uh, project. We'll conclude with our brief prayers at the altar. Om Garana Hantwa Ganapati Gamava Mahe Gavinga Vinam Hupamashravastamam Jeshtarajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Patahana Shrenvan Utebesir Sadanam Om Mahaganapata Namaha Ishwaro Guru Ratmeti Murti Bheda Vibhagine Vyoma Vad Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Gurum Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschadukha Bhagavata Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityor Mahamrathangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tat Sat Sat <coughs>